Hi everybody, hope you're well. Today I'll read from a book titled City with a Hidden Past, uh, edited by Fumiko Maki and published by the Kajima Institute Publishing Company. What does it mean to understand the form of a city? The answer to this seemingly plain question is by no means simple. To understand the history, social organization and economic system of a city, for example, is not to know and remember every phenomenon that has occurred there. Instead, it is first necessary to discover what the most important principles underlying those phenomena are. Only then will we understand the significance of an interrelationship between phenomena. The same can be said of the form of a city. No one is fully cognizant of all the diverse elements from which a large city is composed, nor is there a need for such knowledge. Therefore, we grasp first the whole and then the parts by means of shapes and images that have been sorted out in some way. For that, there are maps, photographs and, from earlier periods, picture scrolls and woodblock prints. In recent times, reconstruction models have helped further our understanding, but they are still far from sufficient. By contrast, we can examine with our own eyes the city we live in at present. Ample material, perhaps even an excess of material, exists on the subject. The problem, first of all, is to know what to look at, and unless we have a point of view, we cannot get a true understanding of form or morphology. Urban morphology is perceived as an accumulation of elements, such as the mountains that surround the city, the rivers that flow through the town, the arrangement of streets and blocks, and the fenestrations and ornamentations of buildings. People can move freely amidst these elements and receive and record impressions of individual and continuous changes in form. However, a viewpoint that has been adjusted in some way is necessary, given the breadth of things in the city we may see and from which we may receive impressions. People have therefore dealt uh, for various reasons and by various means with the fact that the whole is difficult to see, even though individual elements may be easily perceived. The Nolli map, which is well known among architects and frequently referenced in this book, showed the 17th century Rome from a fresh perspective, based on a figure-ground relationship. It showed quite clearly with what morphological intentions that city was created by rendering buildings in dark poche and leaving exterior spaces uh, such as roads and squares white. Furthermore, it revealed the composition of public domains and private uh, domains in Rome. The interiors of public buildings were left white, just as outdoor squares and street spaces were. In the 1950s, the American urbanist uh, Kevin Lynch, by monitoring and analyzing the way people observed uh, cities, established that certain formal elements in cities left the greatest impression on people. He showed that an image map uh, could be drawn in any city in the world with five elements. Paths, edges, districts, nodes and landmarks. His method, based on image, was of great importance in demonstrating that it was possible to transcend uh, cultural differences in expressing the way we look at a city. Although these studies have undeniably contributed in some measure to our understanding of the external characteristics of forms and impressions made by forms, they have failed to delve deeper and cast light on the intentions and meanings behind urban forms. That is, we cannot achieve a true understanding until we comprehend at the same time what each urban form means within the cultural context of urban society. In particular, indicating figure-ground relationships as Nolly did is by no means a suitable method for uncovering the character of cities that owe their development to a mindset or ideas entirely different from those on which Western cities are based. Especially when, as in Japan, those cities are characterized by gaps. The same can be said of Lynch's image map. The most important aim of research into urban morphology is to reveal, through an analysis of patterns and shapes, why and by what means a certain form or structure came into being. Clearly, in many cases, the resulting urban form or structure is not a pure expression of intention, but the imperfect consequence of various factors and happenstance. 
However, such imperfections always characterize the process by which a city is created and are not undesirable. Rather, they render a city more interesting, endowing it with unexpectedness, newness, ambiguity and irony. One way to seek a better understanding of urban morphology is to discover what might be called the deep structure existing behind the imperfect expressions constituting the surface of urban form. We gradually gain an understanding of structure by clarifying the principles unique to a city, or the community from which that city developed, or the relationship between those principles. The principles may be morphological or spatial, but if we can discover the reasons behind those principles, we can elucidate the relationship or structure between elements. For example, the grid pattern clearly has a different meaning and structure for each community. An arrangement in which urban territory is demarcated and city blocks are created on the basis of two orthogonal axes can be said to be among the most universal and commonsensical patterns made by human beings, one that transcends regional and cultural differences. Aside from cities in the ancient period such as Kyoto and Nara that were based on the walled cities of China, many castle towns, including Edo, had grid patterns. As a rule, a grid pattern was used to indicate a residential area of people of the same social status. But the location within the city and the size of a particular grid reflected the social status of the residents. In particular, the blocks assigned to untouchables found in old castle towns, though also based on a grid pattern, were often far smaller in dimension compared with other blocks, confirming that uh, there was indeed an intent to form a separate territory for each social rank. Understanding the grid pattern is thus the first step in reading the structure behind it. In the creation of cities in the West, importance has always been attached to the relationship between the parts and the whole. The parts were conceived to be subordinate to the whole, and if a part was ever emphasized, it was done so in deliberate defiance of the whole. The relationship between the parts and the whole was not perceived in such a way in the process of urban development in Japan. The Japanese have long seen small spaces as autonomous microcosms and thus developed the perception that a part was in fact as a whole. A single house could be seen as the man-made world in miniature, having to contend with all the forces of nature. Everything about Edo, from the subdivision of lots and building materials to the overall concept, was strictly determined on the one hand, and such microcosms were created at will on the other. Japanese cities are often said to have no public squares. Moreover, outdoor public spaces in western cities are often combined with public buildings, such as churches, stadiums, markets, theaters and city halls. It is interesting to consider from the perspective of spatial politics why public facilities and spaces that are so prominent in other cultures were absent in Edo. Edo, the city that became Tokyo, already had a population exceeding 1 million at the beginning of the 19th century, making it the biggest city in the world at the time. The only conspicuous buildings in Edo were Edo Castle, temples and shrines. The Tokugawa shogunate was able to maintain peace and order for 300 years, a rare achievement in world political history. A feudal organization such as the shogunate considered the divide and rule a necessary strategy. The top ranking members of the samurai or warrior class that ruled over farmers, artisans and tradesmen under the feudal class system were obliged to observe the custom of alternate attendance. This enabled the shogunate to control the samurai by requiring them to divide their time between their own domains and Edo, where they left behind their families as permanent hostages. The artisans and merchants who were the residents of Edo were not given public squares or facilities that could become centers of rebellion. Countless places of scenic beauty and historic interest, including temples and shrines, were arranged instead.
There, members of all classes, even samurai of refined taste, enjoyed moments of leisure. In this way, an ingenious strategy of spatial politics, one that permitted only small numbers of people to gather, guaranteed peace and order in Edo. A social structure that is on the whole not highly centralized produces an urban structure that is itself not highly centralized. However, the absence of a center was offset by the presence of placeness in diverse forms. Many of the names of neighborhoods and places such as slopes, uh, crossroads and fields in Japanese cities are derived from the topography of those places or historical events that occurred there, showing that in their minds and in the actual construction of the urban environment, the Japanese used mnemonic devices and subtle manipulations of the topography to compensate for the absence of a center. Such points of singularity were therefore abundant and diverse. These focal points were by no means monumental, but instead integrated into the sphere of everyday life of small groups. A focal point of this kind gave a district a modicum of identity. There were a number of stages in the transformation of urban morphology from Edo to Tokyo over the course of 400 years. At each stage, various principles were made use of in urban development. For each class, residential districts were designated, dimensions of blocks and sizes of lots determined, and building types assigned. However, as Edo expanded, forms and mechanisms of control intended to reflect the social system collapsed. Since the Meiji Restoration of 1868, Japan has undergone a radical modernization. Edo became Tokyo, and new functional, legal and institutional images of the city have been layered over the old city. Moreover, the great Kanto earthquake and air strikes during World War II destroyed much of the older urban areas, and what survived has been subject in the decades since the war to both an enormous increase in the volumes and heights of buildings and a fragmentation of property. The city has been changing materially as well, from clay, wood and roof tiles to concrete, steel, tiles, plastic and glass. Notwithstanding those changes, it is not very difficult even today to find traces of the structural principles and styles that have long existed in Japanese cities. Methods of urban arrangement based on geomancy, ways of laying streets, ways of treating the external layers of the man-made environment, ways of creating points of singularity, spatial concepts of oku and gaps, nature and the formalization of nature that are so closely related to all of the above, not only in the fragments of older urban areas that remain, but in newly developed urban areas as well. To see and understand the city is to understand such structural principles, and we are one step closer to understanding the city as culture when we are able to grasp the city as a thing consisting of two layers, the image that is actually visible, and the image that is concealed underneath. More than 40 years have passed uh, since the Japanese language edition of this book was first published, and this is the first English translation. The Kajima Technical Research Institute was established in 1949 by the Kajima Corporation, that is one of the oldest and largest construction companies in Japan. The institute plays a key role in research and development activities on advanced construction technologies. As for the book at your local bookstore, thank you very much for watching this video and see you in the next one.